Back in the 50s in southwest Nova Scotia, the roads were not very good and the fog was always thick, which made driving difficult, even for the best drivers. And this guy that's writing this says, my father at 17 was in the Canadian Navy. He got drunk and got into a fight and landed himself in jail. This was about an hour's drive from where my grandparents lived. So they got word of what happened and they set out to pick him up from the jail. On their way home, it got dark and the fog rolled in, it was very thick just like the fog we have around here sometimes. And my grandfather was not a good driver at the best of times, and the conditions on this night drove his anxiety through the roof. He had a death grip on the steering wheel and white knuckles that my dad said illuminated the interior of the car. He had been following a larger vehicle for about 30 minutes with nowhere to pass, and the leading vehicle was quite slow. You ever been there like that? Like a log truck going up a hill? You just have to be patient. Eventually, the vehicle he was following stopped and just sat there. My grandfather, in his angry voice, said to my grandmother, what in the world is that man doing stopped in the middle of the road? To which my grandmother replied, Ephraim, the man is in his driveway. True story, true story. The title of this sermon is The Saint and the Sorcerer. The term sorcery in scripture is continually used in reference to an immoral or false practice. Sorcery can be seen as an effort to circumvent God's knowledge and sovereignty and to worship Satan instead. Galatians 5, 19 to 21 says this, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness and orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Would you bow your heads? Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for this important part of our service where we get to dive in to your word, Lord. So we pray that you will direct this word to where you want it to go and that it will have the cause and the effect that you want it to have. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in the history of Paul, Saul, his original name, Saul. Saul was his Jewish name. Paul was his Roman name. He was a Roman by birth, but a Jew by heritage. And in his history, we first see him in the Bible at the stoning of Stephen, which was the first martyr. And he was watching over the coats of the men who were stoning Stephen. And he was approving of that death by guarding the coats of those who were working that iniquity. On that day, a persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And the, all except for the apostles, the saints scattered to different places. And there were churches here and there. And in Acts chapter 8, Starting with verse 3, it says, But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged both men and women and put them in prison. So Paul's conversion, or Saul's conversion, was on the road to Damascus. You know that story? He was on the way there to bring Christian people back to Jerusalem, to have them tried. And he voted against them and approved of their execution. But he was struck blind in Acts chapter 9. As he, neared the, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And in Acts chapter 9, uh, verse 8 and 9, he says, Saul got up from the ground and when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. 
So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. What Saul had been doing obviously displeased God. The Lord could have destroyed Saul. He could have destroyed him. But God had a plan <laughs> for that man. He was called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. The very man who approved the stoning of Stephen, who voted against the Christians, who dragged him off and, and caused him to be in prison, and God called him to preach. Acts chapter 9, verse 10 to 19. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. By the way, God still calls to people in visions. He still does that. I got saved in a vision. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Something is already happening in Saul's life. He was taken in by a believer, apparently, and he's not eating anything. He's praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Verse 13, Lord Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. In other words, Ananias is saying, wait a minute, you want me to go? And, and, and he, I, I mean, this guy's a bad guy. God has a directive that overrules what we think about things. Amen? Amen? But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. There's two kinds of people. There's Gentiles and Israelis. He's been called to share the gospel with everybody that he comes across. Then, I, and then Ananias, well, it says in verse 16, I, uh, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And we do know that Paul suffered a lot of things. Then, I, and then Ananias went to the house and entered it. So Ananias said, I will go as you have instructed me in this vision. Yes, Lord, I will. It doesn't seem like a good idea, but I'm going to do it. Sometimes we have to overcome our own idea and do what God wants us to do. Amen. Amen. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. He got up and was baptized. He didn't get up and eat. He hadn't eaten for three days. But when he got up, he could see, and he didn't go for the food. He didn't say, where's a chow? He said, where's some water? I want to get baptized. He was all the way in. He was all the way in. Then he took some food in verse 19 and regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Now then, in Acts, cha in, uh, in Acts chapter 13, now the church at Antioch there, in the church of Antioch, there were many prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now this is, this is forward to A.D. between 46 and 49. Um, so, so this is a while. This is a while after. Saul has been hanging out with the believers for a while. And where it says Barnabas and Simon called Niger. Now some commentators think he had black hair, but they all had black hair. 
And I think this was a black man. I think Simon, called Niger, was from, maybe he's from Nigeria, I don't know, but I, but I think this was a, a black fellow and one of the very earliest uh, believers. But even at this early time, there were churches where the gifts of the Holy Spirit were in effect. Even at this early time, the prophetic gifts were God's way of speaking to the people. Prophecy continued from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And um, the teachers or scribes were educating the church in the connection between the existing scriptures of Old Testament and the reports about Jesus, Messiah, who had come to be the ultimate sacrifice for sin. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. They were still living it. They were still doing it. But the Messiah had come had fulfilled the prophecies about him. So the preachers and teachers among the believers used the Old Testament prophecies to prove that the Messiah had come. Up to this time, the churches were Jewish. There might have been a few Gentile believers that were drawn in, but they were Jewish up until this time. So the disciples in Jerusalem, they had been the one who scattered after the persecution of the um, church in Acts chapter 8. They carried the gospel wherever they went, resulting in churches. When you carry the gospel, a church can happen. And that's what they did. Because people said, yeah, I believe that. My family believes that. Let's open our house and invite other people around here. And they started believing. And there were churches. That's how they started. Well, they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, verse 2. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. In verse 3, so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So Saul and Barnabas were ordained. They placed their hands on them and they were commissioned and ordained to go as God spoke through the, through the people that got the word, through the prophets at that time. And they were commissioned by the church at Antioch at the direction of the Holy Spirit to go forth into the Gentile world with the good news. And at that time, if you went to the Gentile world with something strange to them, they, maybe they will kill you, like some of them will today. But observe that Satan always tries to destroy the work of anyone who carries the gospel. He always tries to destroy the work. He tries to destroy the churches. He tries to do everything he can to keep us from sharing the gospel outside of the church. And he does everything he can to destroy, to discredit, to distract, and to dilute the power of the gospel. But he can't. He can't. He tries, but he can't. Because that's God's power in the gospel. And he has agents everywhere. Satan has agents everywhere. Sorcery is one of the tools that Satan uses. Because people believe that. It's a lie, but people believe it. The work of God in the believer is to build us up in the faith. We're to build up each other in the holy faith. The work of Satan and his agents is to cause chaos, destruction, and to interfere with the holy light of the gospel. Then we go to Acts chapter 13, starting with verse 4. And here they go, Barnabas and Saul. The two of them went on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia, and sailed from there to Cyprus. Barnabas was a native of Cyprus. That was his island that he came from. When they arrived at Salamis, or Salome, I don't know how they pronounce that, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. This John was John Mark, who was the Mark that wrote the Gospel of Mark. It wasn't the John 
there's too many Johns in the Bible, you have to sort them out. But this is John Mark, who in the Bible is known as Mark. So Paul and Barnabas were the evangelists sent by God, commissioned to bring the gospel. They were sent to the Gentiles, but not only the Gentiles, the opening in this community was through the Jewish community that existed where they traveled. That was always the opening. The Jews would at least have some idea of what they were talking about when they said Messiah. They would have some idea. And they traveled in verse 6 through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus. So a Jewish man became a sorcerer. Paphos was the was where the governor resided, the governor of Cyprus, the island of Cyprus. And it was famous for its temple to Venus. Since this place was steeped in pagan activity, it was important that the Son of God be revealed there. We'd have to go into where the sin is to reveal the power of the gospel to triumph over that sin. That's a hard thing, but they were called and commissioned to do that. So they did. Any prophet that's a sorcerer is a false prophet. If a prophet claims to be a prophet, but he's also conjuring spirits and stuff like that, he's a false prophet. All sorcery is evil and against God. There are only two supernatural sources, only two sources for things to happen that are not explained by the laws of nature. One is God and the other is Satan. Verse 7, who was an attendant, the sorcerer, of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. So something piqued his curiosity. These two characters are coming from Antioch and bringing this gospel message, and he wants to know what it's about. So Serge, we'll give him a nickname, we'll call him Serge. Serge wanted to hear the word of God. This statement about that, it's not insignificant. His desire to hear the message came from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit puts that drawing and that curiosity into one's heart. The action of the Holy Spirit upon the heart is God's partnering with the one who carries the message. Always. You can't get saved without the Holy Spirit drawing you, bringing conviction. Serge, I'll keep on with the nickname. Serge was a great man. He was a governor over the whole island. He was in charge. He was a Gentile with a Jewish sorcerer as his attendant. Now, Satan sets things up like that. He was in a position to be of critical use to the carriers of the gospel. He could expel them from the island. He could imprison them. He could forbid them to speak. And they were forbidden a lot of times to speak. But the Holy Spirit was at work in this man, in Serge. As a Gentile convert in a place of authority, he would be able to influence the Venus worshipers to hear the gospel. The Elamus, the sorcerer, it says in verse 8, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. There's always opposition. If you tell somebody that has a close friend that's an occult person about Jesus, the, that person's going to try to turn him. He's going to try to turn him away from what you're trying to tell him. 
God's on your side. The Holy Spirit's on your side. But the person has a free will. So apparently the sorcerer had two names. Paul had two names. Saul was Jewish name. He was a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. And Paul was his Roman name, for he was also a Roman citizen. The first name, Bar Jesus, which means the son of Joshua, or the son of Yeshua, in the Syriac version of uh, the translation of the Bible, it is translated Bar Shone, meaning the son of pride. His other name, probably Greek, uh, Elamus means sorcerer. Verse 9, then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elamus and said, you were a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. <laughs> Who was led by the hand in darkness before this? Paul! <laughs> And now, and now this sorcerer at, 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 uh, at this encounter with Paul has become blind. You will not even be able to see the light of the sun. When the proconsul, Serge, saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So, he had been exposed to the teachings, to the gospel truth about Jesus, and now he saw with this miracle that what he had heard is, the, is in fact the true working of God because Venus was just a thing they worshipped they didn't they couldn't interact with Venus they didn't get any kind of blessings out of Venus they might have had some imaginary things but but he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord and it says he believed that was the moment of his turning the miracle of blindness of the evil one was the occasion of his believing It was the moment of his believing, but it was the teaching, the gospel, the word that amazed him. The teaching prevailed over the opposition of the enemy, the sorcerer. The governor of the island, in the midst of Venus worshipers, and in opposition of an agent of Satan became a believer. The word of God triumphed. It's God's triumph when anybody comes yes. to the Lord and becomes a believer. Yes. Because Satan doesn't want any of us to be believers. Doesn't want anybody to have, to, to hear the word of the gospel in their ears. He doesn't want them to read it, hear it, or see it. And he never rests in that. He never stops trying to stop the gospel. He's been trying that for thousands of years and he has not been successful except in some people but not as a blanket thing. Paul and Barnabas were commissioned. They were set apart at the instruction of the Holy Spirit to go into the Gentile world. Acts 1 and chapter 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And that was spoken to all believers. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Those were the final words of Jesus before taking up into heaven. The Great Commission, words for all disciples, instructions to be followed until the close of the age, which is getting closer to us. But it's in the same verse about the power of the Holy Spirit coming on you and then you being witnesses. That power comes from the Holy Spirit, comes from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This task is for all of us, the task. 
We all have work to do. We are to influence those around us for good, for God, for the kingdom, and for the sake of the gospel. Paul and Barnabas went into a hostile world. Satan tried to stop the word from being preached through this sorcerer that he had in place. Our faith has always been opposed. There's always opposition. Somewhere on earth, there's always been opposition to the gospel. People are being murdered for being Christians. In, in, in North Korea and Sudan, you can, you can get killed for being a Christian. Do you remember Dylan Claybold? Does that name ring a bell? There were two guys that went on a rampage and shot people in Columbine school. Remember that? And Dylan Claybold would ask the kids if they were Christians and if they were, he shot them. There's always opposition. America was once thought of as a Christian nation because it was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Now there are forces of evil, pure evil, trying to eliminate the influence of God in our society. Abortion is evil. There's no way to, to, to excuse abortion. There are those in the government who, who are opposed to a law that would require medical assistance to a baby that was aborted but born alive. People in our government would deny that live child any medical assistance, just let it die. Evil, that's pure evil. Transgender thinking is becoming thrust on our children in the schools. It's evil. I'm trying to eliminate the use of gender-based pronouns. That's not only evil, it's silly. It's crazy, it's ridiculous. Genesis 127, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Children as young as eight years old are being told to examine their feelings and see what gender they are. Not how they were born, but see how they feel about themselves. And if they think they're a different gender than how they were born, they're given puberty blockers to prevent them from developing normal characteristics. Prevent them from going into puberty, from developing normally. This is evil. I have two, two articles by physicians that claim this is child abuse. And it is. And not only that, but psychologists say that those confused gender feelings usually resolve themselves in late adolescence. But for these kids, it's too late. And not only that, but there's harmfulness in these drugs to the body of the people that are doing it. Hostility abounds because Satan never stops trying to pervert society. The only hope humans have is the love of God. Hatred and chaos is all around us. Look at the faces of leftist politicians on television. Look at their faces. As a Christian, you have, you have the ability to discern. You have discernment. And you see hatred and evil in certain faces. Listen to what they're saying. The church has become a benign institution, watered down, prayerless, social justice preaching, justifying abortion, condoning gay marriage, openly gay bishops. Leviticus 18, 22 says, do not have sexual relationships with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Detestable. 
1 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for the slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. We have an epic of child abuse. The police have to advise churches, you know, to be careful about people that just come in off the street and want access to kids. There's an epidemic of child abuse in one particular church. I was, when I was in business, they had, there was a, there was a case in Altoona against a particular priest. And um, I was called to go over there and take pictures in the church, in the rectory, in that particular priest's bedroom, and out the window of the view of the school and the playground across the street. It was creepy. The attorney was there for the church. The attorney was there that I was taking pictures for. And um, that was creepy. And that's just one. That's just one that they find out about. There's so many. An epidemic. Child abuse. But please have to advise churches how to make sure that the children are safe. No wonder people don't want to have anything to do with church. They think all churches are like that. People that aren't in church don't know the difference. They don't want any, anything to do with it. In the larger mainline churches, the message of the gospel is lost. They're feel-good churches. Real, spirit-filled, gospel-carrying churches like ours are on a decline. There is a great falling away in the land. This is happening everywhere. The end is near. We have to shake ourselves loose. Get awake. Get to work. Get the message out. Paul and Barnabas were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so are we. Paul and Barnabas were commissioned by the Holy Spirit. So are we. The same commission falls upon us. Paul and Barnabas faced opposition from a powerful enemy. And so do we. So some will just sit and not do, and not carry the gospel. They just sit. That's a benign believer. Paul and Barnabas prevailed, and so will we. So will we. The antidote for Satan's hatred is God's love. Our charge is to carry that message. To carry the message of God's love. To carry the gospel. And to do the love. It's not enough to say I love you. You have to do. Love is an active thing. You have to do it. You have to do, do for people. And say, you know, God, you know, God told me to, to give this to you. Or to do this for you. Look for opportunities. And that's an influence of a believer. And people will wonder about your motives. And you do it again. And do it again. And you'll win them over. Or you can just be benign. And just wait for the end and not do anything. I think that we should have prayer meetings. Just get together and pray. Just get, we're going to have a board meeting tomorrow night. We'll talk about that. We'll pick a day. Just get together and pray for an hour. Maybe sing a song to open, but just pray for an hour. If you never prayed, never prayed for an hour, it's amazing how time flies. And I don't want to be the only one that prays at this. I just want people to pray and pray and pray and pray about. There's so much that we could pray about. Pray about for each other and for the community and for what's happening in the world and what's happening in Washington and just pray for the influence of God's 
gospel to fall upon ears that the Holy Spirit has prepared to hear and then get them saved. I think we need to have focused prayer meetings. So we'll pick a date, we'll announce that. We'll, we'll talk about that in the board meeting tomorrow night, but I, that might be one thing that we should do. That might be where we're lacking a little bit. I know all of us pray to get together and focus prayer like that. Yeah, I think that's what we should do. What do you think? Should we do that? That was a lukewarm response. <laughs> well, we're going to do it. Some of us will do it. Would you stand? Dear Lord, it's been good to be in the house with you, Lord. It's been good to worship you, to praise you, to honor you. It's been good to share your word. It's been good to be with believers, Lord. Once a week doesn't seem like enough, but it's been good. It's been good, Lord. And we thank you for that. We ask you to be with everyone. And grant us all your mercy and your grace. And be with us all until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Sienna, thanks for coming and being the kid today.